Please join me in this prayer as we prepare our hearts to go to the Word of God today. Lord Jesus, as we recall your ministry, your words, and the words that you have inspired for us this day, we pray that you would open our ears to hear what your Spirit says to us, your church. In Jesus' name, amen. The Word of God this morning comes from Luke chapter 17, beginning at verse 11. Now on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are all the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. To understand the gravity of this text, it's difficult for us to imagine what it's like to have leprosy. But imagine this for a moment. That the church might set a rule to guard against anything that is symbolically unclean that would point to our sin keeping us separated from the holiness of God, that you, having been identified as one with the disease of leprosy, would be unable to come into the presence of God and worship with other God's people. That any worship that you do has to be done in the presence of other lepers that a rule set in Leviticus would have you stay 100 paces away from any other person that's not infected. In other words, the only people that you have the ability to interact with are people that carry the same disease as you. That this disease, killing the nerve endings in all of your extremities, that let's suppose one day you're on cooking duty and you don't feel the flesh burn when you touch the stove, the first indication that you have that your hand is in the fire is the smell of your own burning flesh. That it was set by rule that wherever you went in proximity of anyone that did not have the disease, you were required to call out, unclean, unclean so that those around you might also be made aware that you carry a dreadful disease and have the people scatter. That those you love, may it be a husband, a wife, a child, or a parent, would no longer be able to give you an embrace, to touch you or hold you when you experience loss or grief or pain. Isolation is what they lived. That's why they called from Jesus to Jesus from a distance. Because they could not come into the presence of a rabbi and have the comfort of the rabbi holding their hand to pray for them. They would listen to services from a distance in their group of lepers. Sometimes we enter into a church and they have a cry room behind the glass where if a child becomes unruly or discontent, you bring them there so that you can participate in the service, but only through glass. That was their life. They were separated. And they carried the disease that was the Old Testament type that demonstrated that we are unholy and unable to come into the presence of a holy God and they were the living exemplification of that. That we are separated from God by our sin. 
and we can only know him from a distance. Certainly we understand when they call out to Jesus, having heard what he can do and what he has done before, to have mercy on us. And they do, and he does. He does have mercy on them. He calls out to them, go show yourself to the priest. Now, the instruction in Leviticus is that when you experience healing, you show yourself to the priest, the priest examines you and identifies you as clean so that you can be a part of fellowship with the body, you can worship again, you can go in the temple again, and certainly you would have reason to praise God again. But in this text... Only one comes back. Now before we deal with nine, I want to deal with the one. The one comes back. He's identified as a Samaritan. Now Samaritans in that culture were the people that didn't see themselves as being able to have as good a relationship with God as the Jews. The Jews were pure blood. They were a purer race and they worshipped in Jerusalem. The Samaritans worshipped on other hills and as we know from the Samaritan woman at the well, they would worship on their own hills but didn't feel like it was the same level of worship as those in Jerusalem. The fact is that the Jews expected God's blessing because they were God's chosen people, but the Samaritans didn't. And like the Samaritan woman, gave testimony immediately of what transforming power was within him. He went to say thanks. And a better translation that rise and go, your faith has made you well. First of all, it says rise. So when he came to say thanks, he fell down before him in worship. Because he says rise and go. Your faith has made you well. More specifically, your faith has made you whole. Now, is there diff there's a difference between well and whole. Your faith has made you whole means not only did he receive healing in his body, he received healing in his spirit. This tells us something about a thankful heart. It's a heart that's humble. It's a heart that goes to God to recognize who God is in our life and we receive wholeness when we are thankful before God. Even the forgiveness of sins in that wholeness. Now I want to look at the other nine. Why didn't they show? Where are they? To paraphrase Jesus, where are the thankful? I did a study through the scriptures and I'm not going to go through all of them, just quick reference. Ingratitude, did you know that ingratitude is a characteristic of the wicked described in Romans 121? Being ungrateful is a character of the wicked. When we consider the words that come out of our mouth that may be complaints, frustrations, comparison to others, that comes from wickedness, not holiness. Isaiah chapter 1, two and th verses 2 and 3 identify that ingratitude is inexcusable. In other words, you don't get a pass for it. It's inexcusable. Which we as believers make sense. It is inexcusable that we, God's created beings, the highest created beings in his order, that have been made as image bearers of God, that would receive the grace of God to forgive us of our sins, bless us with life, joy, peace, happiness. And the list goes on and on and on, as we've sung 10,000 reasons. It is inexcusable that we would have a heart that is not thankful. Jeremiah chapter two and Micah verse six talk about ingratitude as being unreasonable. So first it's inexcusable. Second, it's, it's unreasonable. Anyone with just reason, recognizing that we owe everything to God, don't we? Would any of us be here without him? Psalm 139 says that each of us were conceived in the secret place by God's divine touch. Our very conception, our very life, breath, is due to our God. 
It's unreasonable. Especially when we know as revealed in his word all that he has done and all that he will do on our behalf for our benefit. What has God gained from you? What have you given God that God didn't have before? What have I done on this earth that has given God anything more than he had before? Deuteronomy 32 expresses it uh, in gratitude as exceeding folly, exceeding foolishness, not just foolishness, but foolishness which abounds that we would have in gratitude towards God. There are several texts that talk about the guilt of ingratitude and not being thankful. One that might surprise us, Deuteronomy 31 and 32 in Jeremiah chapter 5 identify that prosperity produces ingratitude. Isn't it ironic that the more that we have received by God, the less inclined we are to thank him? Think of the, the mere request for daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Can you see that the gratitude of a person that does not have bread in the morning is going to be much more thankful when bread is given than someone at the whim that you run out of bread and you just go to the store and you buy three more loaves? You drop a couple in the freezer just in case? You've got a bread maker in the pantry that you haven't used in years? You see, the more we have, the less we can depend on God for giving it because we forget how prosperous we are. In fact, the common denominator of the verses that deal with ingratitude is this, that we forget God. The warning Moses gave the people is, after all that you've been through, the daily manna provided from heaven, do not forget what God has done for you. But we do. We forget. We take God for granted. Especially when we're prosperous. Oh, there are plenty of warnings against ingratitude, and there are plenty, plenty of texts that encourage us to be thankful But if we're not in touch with those verses and those words, it's easy to forget. Many times it's illustrated how the people of Israel showed ingratitude towards God and forgot him. The examples abound. But we don't have to go to the scriptures for examples. We merely look around and consider. Let's say, for example, those people in our nation, for example, that claim Christianity. Let's suppose that 75% of citizens of the United States who recognize our God as God and identify themselves as Christian really know Jesus. Where are they? How come they don't show? Here in the text, we've got 10%. And I want to tell you, I'm thankful for the 10%. I am so thankful for the 10%. I'm thankful for the fellowship that I share with them. The joy that is cultivated in worship. The, the sweet communion of service with other people who love the Lord as I. The encouragement that I receive from those who have the spiritual gift of encouragement. The blessing of disciples who love to make disciples. I'm reminded frequently that in my work, I am not alone. I have brothers and sisters and family members who serve God alongside of me, and I recognize with thanksgiving that I am surrounded by the 10% all the time. And it is a joy. That's why I believe Paul, when he writes to the church, says, I thank God every time I think of you. I thank, I thank God for you every time I pray for you. I see the work of your hands 
in the sanctuary and in the lifeblood of the church. And I'll, I'll see it walking in a parade on Saturday night. And I'll see it worshiping on a Sunday morning. And I, I see it over and over and over again. And I do not take it for granted. I don't take it for granted for the opportunity to preach the gospel and to study God's word to a congregation who loves God like me and wants to grow. I want to read another text. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days and people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I don't think it's unique to the last days that people will be ungrateful. I think people have been ungrateful since God made us. But may that not be you. And may that not be me. Let us pray that we would always remain in the 10% that our heart might not grow bitter due to a difficult circumstance or difficulty in our life where we grow bitter and sour against God because the ravages of sin and the work of the evil one in this world? Would we have the evil one rob away the thankfulness in our hearts for what God has done for us? For we know that even though we do have the pains and the scars and the difficulties, that we have in this life with the evil one and the fallen nature and all the evil in the world, we have a hope that is greater than that. Death has lost its sting. So may we cultivate the love for the Lord Jesus Christ with a thankful spirit day after day after day. And when you find your heart and your mind leaning toward an ungrateful spirit, one that might compare yourself to another who has more May the Lord by his spirit prompt you to guard your heart from that temptation so that we might be thankful each and every day for all the good gifts that the Lord has given us. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, none of us here have leprosy. Thank you for that but we all might as well have in our distance from you as a holy God from our sin. Yet by the, the blood of your son, you paid for it. And Lord, we ask this day that we would be washed fresh and clean of all the sinful desires in our heart. For when we have an ungrateful spirit or bitterness or anger or other things that don't please you, we ask that you would wash us clean, that we would shine, that the light of Christ within us would be displayed with a thankful spirit, that those around us would see you and give glory to our Father in heaven. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Amen. Now, at, at this time... I want to give an opportunity to anyone who is present. If you don't normally worship with us, that's absolutely okay. Our purpose isn't to uh, thank people in the congregation for what they've done for us. The opportunity that we have is to thank God for people and for the things in our life as an offering of praise. So if you'd like to give thanks, we have a mic right here that is open. So anyone that would like to come up and give a testimony of praise, you're more than welcome to do that at this time.
Am I that short? <laughs> happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And happy Thanksgiving to Debbie Aaron Roger. Um, my husband recently had to have emergency surgery. And I kind of ignored it because I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't even want to look at him because I thought it's just going to break down. And I was thinking, no, I can't go through another loss, you know, losing my mom, my siblings. It's, and Thanksgiving being such a big part of our lives, um, I just kind of brushed it aside until I talked to Pastor Wayne. And he helped me through it. Um, also, <clears throat> I haven't been here for a while because I did have a bad fall, and I'm just going to having coverage of the spine and stuff. It, it's just gonna take such a long time to heal, but um, I was heavily medicated, and I was wondering if some of my feelings were from the medication, so I went off of it. Um, I didn't wanna come back to church. I was feeling I was missing the people here that had left. Some I was very close to, and um, I don't know where Ani had said, you belong here. That's when Debbie R. left. And I had mixed feelings about it, you know. And um, when I did come back, I felt so much love from everybody. Um, and we did Bible study after church last week, and Pastor didn't really know how I felt. And this really gave me confirmation that um, how Satan attacks the church, and that's what he's been doing. And yes, we do miss some of the empty seats here, but our God is here with us, our church family, and just to focus on the Lord. And Tess, come here, honey. This girl, since she's been a little girl, has been praying for me. I mean, she's just an, an inspiration to me. And I love her so much. And I love the DeVue family. They've been so great to me. And I really do love this church. And I want to try really hard not to let Satan creep back in. And I'm just so grateful to be here with everybody. Amen. So. The first thing that comes to my mind is the, the No Regrets Men's Study that, that we've been, there's a Monday night group and there's a Wednesday morning group. I'm part of the Wednesday morning group. And I think we've been meeting for something like uh, two and a half years. And as I've shared with you before, it's, um, it's a study that is uh, training us to be disciples. And which, which in this study we have to look at many aspects of our lives and it's caused me to change many areas of my life that needed change. Most notably and most recently was um, uh, my marriage, which was, which was great <laughs> in my eyes, it, but it's, it, it's gone from great to be, be, beyond great. It's like unbelievable. We got remarried in, um, in January and it's really just changed my life. And I'm, I'm very thankful for the, um, the men's study, this church, and uh, my new marriage. I'm a newlywed. I wasn't really prepared for this, but um, I made this like list that what I'm thankful for, and my first one is Jesus and God. My second is my loving family, a roof over my head, food and water, especially coming to church like today and seeing all these 
nice people that are here. Um, my friends at school, um, my awesome cousins, that we have a free country, and the sun that shines every day and that I can look at. Mm, my last one is the Bible. I can sit down and read every day. Thank you. So I must say, Cameron's hard to follow. <laughs> but he mentioned a free country. And Thanksgiving is, uh, was, uh, is a national holiday declared by George Washington. And um, he, he was our president um, many, many years after the pilgrims um, landed. And we think of the pilgrims uh, cel celebrating with the Native Americans. But uh, this year, um, I want to share with my grandchildren the real meaning of Thanksgiving. And as we do at Christmas time, before we uh, open gifts and get into the, the traditional uh, hoopla of Christmas, we like to remind them of the real story of Christmas. And um, so, um, I can credit this knowledge to um, to Rush Limbaugh and, and in terms of his historical studies and the books he's written about the um, founding of our country and the pilgrims. But um, when when the pilgrims landed, there were there were 40 that came over. 20 died the first winter. The following spring, um, they did learn from the Native Americans uh, planting corn and and other things, I guess, and making uh, coats from beaver skins and things that would help them survive. But um, the, it, it, the real difference that brought about Thanksgiving was they originally, um, under the leadership of William Bradford, they, they thought that it was the kind thing to do to have one storehouse that everybody brought their whatever they produced to the storehouse and everyone got an equal share. And what they, the consequence of that the, the first year was that some people were not as um, productive as others. It, there was not motivation when everybody got the equal share. And they then, um, under Bradford's leadership again, they came together and they decided that they would embrace a system such as we have in the United States today where you, um, you get to keep what you produce, you get to decide what to do with it, you get to share it as you will. And under the system, they produced abundance. And out of that abundance, they decided to share with the Indians at the first um, at the first Thanksgiving, and so that is a system that has remained in the United States, and that we need to be very, very grateful for. And we need to be grateful that um, from the beginning we had a, a president who honored God, and in today's. Uh, um, uh, changing ways, we are um, 
seeing our nation want to separate from God, and we, we need to be thankful that um, God has been and is a part of our, um, of our nation, that we do have a free country, and that we have been graced by being born here, and that we, uh, it's by God's grace that we're called to be stewards of this free nation. And um, I'm thankful for that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I feel like I shouldn't be nervous because you guys are like family to me. Um, but I still am. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I first want to thank God for my three so handsome nephews. Um, oh, man, as the youngest of the family, it's such a blessing to have them. And I also want to thank God for my boyfriend. Um, he has been with me for two years, and, oh my gosh. I wouldn't be the person I am today without him. I would be in such a bad place. And he's stuck with me throughout everything. And in high school, there are the best times and the worst times. <laughs> and I feel like there's a lot of worst times in high school that you get to learn from. And he still stayed with me, and I stayed with him. And I feel like I've learned so much being in this relationship. Um, and I've learned what makes a relationship special. Um, and not just for our age, but for eventually marriage, what's important for marriage. Um, yeah, so I'm thankful for my boyfriend. I'm going to say it this way. I'm grateful for family. And not the family God gave me. I love my family. Uh, my parents, and my, my brothers and sisters and I are, are, are very close and I love them dearly and I'm very thankful for them. But I'm also thankful for the family that I chose. When you uh, get married, as you say, you don't, you're, you always say that, oh, you're not losing a daughter or you're not losing a son. You're actually gaining a daughter or you're gaining a son. But when you marry the woman of your dreams, the man of your dreams, you're not just gaining that person. You're also gaining their entire family. And at our church, we're going through this series called Compelling Christianity. And it's asking us, who compelled you to live for Christ? family that I chose. We were a, a Christian family growing up. We went to, we went to the church every Sunday. We, you know, we went to church on Christmas. We were a loving family. And I, looking back, I can't say anything bad about it. But I didn't understand what a Christ-like life was until I met Vern and Faye Fryer and all three of their kids. And the women that... Melissa's brothers chose to marry and the, and the families that they came from and, and Melissa and I'm thankful to God for the family that I chose. Thankful for him. 
Irish temperance. <laughs> On that note, I know that we could continue thanking God all day, and it's my prayer that we will, that we will not cease to give God glory in this sanctuary, but that we would continue to give God glory as we gather with people whom we love, as we share an abundance of food, as we share the blessing of love with the relationships the Lord has given us, and that that thankful spirit would be a testimony and a glory to our God. We're going to close out the service with, with two songs. And both of them are powerful testimonies. And I pray that the Lord would sharpen the testimony that he has placed in our heart so that we can continue to share that grace with others. Let's stand and sing praise to our God. May our God of grace pour out his richest mercies and love on you this day that you would receive them fully have your hearts and minds and very souls blessed to give him praise to pour out your thanksgiving and to glorify his blessed name in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen